too. <laughs> Hello, everyone. This is Shane Gibson with Rackman, and welcome to Digital Rebar Online Meetup number, lucky number, 13. Uh, I'm having a bit of an audio problem and internet problem today, so hopefully we can get through this. My internet crashed just as I was supposed to be logging in, and I'm trying to get everything back going and connected. Um, how is everybody doing today? We've got a, a large crowd today, so that's fabulous. Um, we, have a, we have, I think, our largest crowd to date. So thank you, everybody. Welcome to uh, lucky number 13 indeed. Uh, for those of you in California, welcome to our sunny California pouring rain, liquid sunshine. Liquid sunshine, that's what it is. <laughs> uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about our new immutable image deploy and I've been having a heck of a time with the uh, demo setup uh, with uh, packet.net so I've uh, switched to loading stuff on my local VirtualBox machine so hopefully we'll be able to show you uh, the output of that at least and the overall process. Uh, we'll show a quick uh, overview of local repos and the uh, use of an external proxy for package caching. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about UX enhancements and new features. We'll also talk briefly about some of the new features coming down the line in digital rebar provision. Uh, we have a whole bunch of interesting changes coming up uh, related to some changes in how our runner and agent or DRP CLI in uh, agent mode operates. Uh, those are actually in tip currently. And then we have coming up in either 3.8 or 3.9 release, not entirely sure where it'll land. Uh, we're gonna be looking at some new workflow changes and there'll be some significant changes to how the workflow process works. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, Victor and Greg with us today, I don't think. I'm not sure that Victor jumped on today with us, but I know Greg is out on vacation, so we're not gonna be able to get too technically deep into the cool whiz bang, uh, uh, fanciness in the uh, the new feature sets. Uh, but we'll talk about them a little bit overall. I, I, Go ahead. I, I would, I'll, I'll break in and work with uh, working. We're, I don't know if it's my internet connection or yours, Rob. Um, I've, you're breaking up. I'll, I'll, I'm not gonna try and talk. Uh, okay, so um, whatever Rob was saying, uh, you can message me uh, and I will put it out there. Uh, then also, um, we'll obviously open up to community uh, for discussion. We have a large community today, so hopefully we'll have some interesting questions and comments and we'll see what we can find out from what the community is thinking today. Uh, we will move the Terraform uh, demo that we were originally scheduling for uh, today's meetup to the next meetup most likely and we'll go over some of the Terraform uh, advanced features and changes in the plugin. Uh, we may or may not have um, demo of some of the new workflow stuff by then. I don't know that we'll have that in, uh, in a usable state by then. Uh, but if so, we'll get a preview of some of the workflow changes. Uh, if not, it'll probably be four weeks from today that we get some of the demo of the workflow changes. Uh, with that being said, uh, let's see if we can taunt the demo gods. So we're going to start out with immutable image deployment stuff. And I'm going to not show you the immutable Windows deployment stuff because Windows is just big. And because I'm having issues with packet.net machines, uh, it takes about 20 minutes in my virtual box environment because I have a very poor setup. So what I'm gonna show you is sort of a, um, uh, the end of the process, which is I have a Windows image here running in my virtual box. It's called Pixie Client One. And this is a image that was wrapped up in a image file uh, format and then served up through the image deploy uh, plugin that is the new image deployment capability, which is uh, a Rackin commercial piece. 
and I will show you how the process works and I'll show you kicking off the process and you'll be able to see what it looks like and how you can actually watch the process go through from beginning to end. So basically uh, looking at the requirements for image deploy, uh, actually I'll go ahead and kick off uh, the Windows image stuff right now and then I'll talk about how it works and we'll see if uh, we can get through it in time before the end of the meetup. We may or may not uh, be able to, get to see that. So basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna kick a machine uh, let's kick a new machine uh, into uh, Discover, and then we're going to re reboot the machine. Currently, the machine is in an Ubuntu install, so we're going to reboot this into a CentOS or into the Windows install process. And so that's going to take just a moment for it to reboot into the Discover process. And I'll go ahead and start a little discussion on how image deploy works. So everything starts with a plugin. So we have the image deploy plugin, uh, which is installed through the regular plugin provider. And once you've installed the plugin provider, you actually need to add a plugin to the system. And we have image deploy added here. Not entirely sure why the state is uh, X as in not available. Uh, I just deployed against this. so. That might just be a little bit of bug between the versioning information uh, in the tip version. Uh, we'll have to take a look at that. Uh, but once you have the plugin installed, to actually use it, it's pretty simple. Uh, you create a profile. Uh, in this case, I have uh, a number of profiles, immutable Windows and immutable Linux. So if we look at the immutable Windows profile, the profile itself defines the operating system version. It defines the type that the image is in so the backend system knows how to handle that. And then it defines either a local file or HTTP URL where we get the image from. So in this case, we're pulling the image from my local HTTP service in my local network. And the image is Windows 2K16, Packer, Windows Undefined, blah, 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 blah. Uh, we're going to jump back to our machine and show you the process of using that profile. We take the profile immutable windows, we apply that to the machine. We see that the machine now has the profile. Oh, by the way, there's a new cool feature that Rob put in, uh, which you may or may not have found yet. If you select a machine in the bulk action section, once it's selected, you can click on a profile to remove it. So if you have a number of profiles, you're juggling back and forth. It's a nice quick way to remove profiles instead of hovering over the profile. Oh, that's my immutable Windows profile and go and remove it. So it's a real nice feature that Rob added in recently. But let's put that back on. And then the next thing to do is pretty simple. We kick the image deploy stage off. So as soon as we hit boom on the machine, the image deploy process kicks off. We have a new task column as well, which you'll see that the task is advancing there from uh, uh, install to the deploy. The in deploy phase, there's not much to see on the uh, console of the machine, but if you saw the SDA disks uh, got formatted and pulled in, so the console emits that message. But what we can see is if we click on the node itself, we can click on the actual task that's running, and we see the task list for this specific uh, um, that's running during the, on this machine. We click on the task itself, we get all of the URL or all of the uh, log data back. And as you can see, we're actually pulling down the image. So here is the image curtain windows, blah, blah, blah. That's being pulled down from my HTTP server and it's being streamed to the disks in the virtual machine. Now it's this process that with the windows, which is a uh, 6.3 gig. So I'm pulling a 6.3 gig uh, image off my Mac machine into my Linux VM from my Linux VM to another uh, VirtualBox VM. So I'm going through a bunch of really bad IO paths, which is why this process takes so long on VirtualBox. On Real Metal, we benchmarked this uh, around uh, eight to 12 uh, minutes with all of the hardware reboots. Obviously your time is gonna vary somewhat depending on hardware reboot time, uh, how big the network pipes are on your uh, image that's being served and how fast your disks are able to write that image down to disk. So those things all make a difference. But 
As we can see, the process is streaming. We can click on the refresh link. We continue to get more feedback on what's happening with this process. So this is really nice to be able to watch what's actually happening with the image deploy process that's occurring here. At the end of this, the machine reboots and we end up with a virtual machine uh, like this. In this case, this image was, Windows image was designed, defined to automatically open up into the desktop after it's installed, which is nice to see. You can see that there's some SIGWIN uh, packages that were embedded in the image as well. Uh, that's a quick overview of how the image process works without seeing some of the guts. If we take a look at some of the guts of what's happening, uh, we have, as always, we have a number of parameters, which are sort of the, the base level components. And we have, these are the parameters that you would define in your profile, which would define how the image deploy process itself would occur. So we've got the image deploy, image file, image OS, image type, image URL, and Windows license key. So if you have your Windows license you want to apply to the machine being imaged, you can actually inject that into the image. We are using the uh, Windows version of Cloud Init, which has a slightly different name, but basically it's Cloud Init. Does anyone remember what the Windows Cloud Init process is? Cloud messed up, or I don't know, Cloud Init. Uh, in any case, the Cloud Init process will do some, po some uh, post provisioning, uh, installing a Windows uh, license key for you. You define through the image file and image URL where the location of that image is, and image OS and type defines. Uh, the, the metadata about your image you're going to install. So those are what you would wrap up in your uh, profile. And I showed briefly previously uh, the, the Windows, the, my Linux one looks basically the same other than image OS is Linux, it's a TGZ file type, and it's being served by my local uh, DRP instance as CentOS tarball, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and this is actually an image uh, which was generated by Digital Rebar. So we're, I am actually actively in the process of developing an image builder process that leverages Digital Rebar to do traditional package-based installs and then extract uh, an image out of that, which are Digital uh, Rebar image deploy process through the rack and commercial pieces is able then to, to lay down on disk. And at the end of the day, when this gets done, uh, hopefully it'll support all the Linux uh, distros. And uh, yesterday in stand-up, um, our ever um, happy and Windows-loving Victor Lowther says to me, so Shane, how are you going to make that work for Windows? And I said, I don't have a freaking clue, but we'll figure it out. We'll figure out how to, to burn the uh, image out of, down out of the built image profile from a um, you know, Windows install. Uh, in the meantime, though, uh, the Linux stuff is already partially working, and this image was built uh, from uh, the image builder process. Uh, stepping away from that and back to the image deploy, uh, we have uh, the stages, which you saw me kick the Windows, Windows image uh, deploy off. There's the image deploy stage which is responsible for the actual actions of deploying the image. So the first thing it does is erase disks. It does the install step uh, to install the bits it needs to be able to do the install and post, de post uh, deployment stuff, as well as the deploy script. And we actually can bore in on the task for the deploy uh, process. And we see that it's actually made up of a number, at rec actually a large number of various templates. So all of these templates are processed in order to do uh, the actual steps of prepping uh, the machine, uh, prepping the hardware for the image to be laid down, laying down the image, setting up the post-deploy hooks, and then bouncing the machine. Uh, and then we also serve uh, metadata to the machine for the post-deploy hooks. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff that's going on there to make that happen. Uh, and that's that in a summary. So um, we have, if we were to go back to our actions, we we'll take a look at our image deploy machine, and we'll see that it's probably sitting in about 90, well, not even 99% yet. When it hits 99%, like all Windows things, it's actually only about 50% done. So this process takes a long time in my environment here. 
what we can do is kick off the uh, let's remove the profile from the built machine um, put it back into discover stage uh, bounce my VM and then uh, what we want to do is add the profile for uh, immutable Linux and then because I've been juggling a million things today, I'm going to double check what I'm doing here. Immutable Linux is going to serve uh, the file uh, with a date stamp of 347 on my local uh, image server. So I want to make sure I've actually got it here. Um, and I don't. So that was a good thing I checked because I have an updated image that I turned out um, So let's fix that real quick. Edit. Yeah, oh, fast, fast scroll. And then let's make sure we got the right image here. 17, 13, yes, yeah, so save. Uh, so our lim image now has the reference to the correct 1713, which actually exists. And then if we take a look at the one of the things I didn't show uh, is the workflow uh, for image deploy. You can build uh, any number of sort of pipelines, but the basic pipeline that you want to start with is image deploy and image deploy cloud and knit, which is going to be the, the post process uh, stuff and then kick into complete success. Um, we see that my first virtual machine here has kicked back over into sledgehammer weight. So we've got the profile uh, mutable Linux set to it. So now we want to do image deploy, kick the process off. You'll see the install process and then hopefully the deploy process. We can take a quick look at it, uh, at the tasks and see what's happening. And we see that the image has started streaming. Um, this process normally takes about uh, 60 seconds on my machine. Uh, right now I've got Got my machine bogged down. I'm doing a couple of bid builds in the background. Plus, we have that Windows image deploy streaming through VirtualBox. So it's running a little bit slow uh, today. But we can see that it's actually estimating somewhere around 45 seconds to stream the image down. And we're actually getting pretty close as we talk here. Uh, boom, the image is done streaming down. Um, and that process has finished and now the machine is rebooting and it should boot into the new image and the new image has a simple Etsy issue splash screen which makes it a little easier to identify on the serial console. So if I did everything right, which I haven't tested this image yet, <laughs> uh, it should hopefully kick off. We see the cloud init stuff just fired and did the post configuration. In fact, I see post configuration stuff that just went by uh, in this image. And if that uh, cloud init process finishes, come on, cloud init, finish up. Uh, what else can I show you whilst we wait for slow? There we go. So there it is. That's the new image that digital rebar uh, Etsy issue in it that I built from the image builder uh, uh, contents that I'm working on here at RackN using the RackN image deploy to deploy Linux. Uh, and if we were to go back to our sad Windows deploy, we would probably see that it's probably still sitting in lots to go. So we'll check in on this later and see if it finishes. Uh, but essentially, the process is exactly the same. It's just a lot slower. Uh, what we just demonstrated there is uh, theoretically successful Windows deploy. Uh, I did a previous successful Windows deploy, which I showed you the, the post steps uh, finishing. And then a Linux deploy, which happened in, I don't know if anyone timed that, but about two, two and a half minutes with a machine reboots uh, on a particularly slow machine. Um, I have benchmarked this at 59 to 60 seconds in VirtualBox for deployments. Uh, and I benchmarked it at about a minute and 10 seconds. Uh, oh no, it was two minutes in packet.net with a machine reboot of a type zero. 
the machine reboot of a type zero takes just over a minute to finish. So within about two minutes on real hardware and packet, we have an image that's blown down to disk. Pretty cool. Uh, with that, I'm going to take a pause because I covered a lot and I talked an awful lot and ask if anyone has any questions about that. Uh, comments, boos, hisses, cheers, jeers. Uh, a lot of people are on mute, so if you want to talk, you might want to check your mute. Normally, I'm not muted. Do you hear me? Yes, can you? Oh, yes, I can. Um, who is it? Yeah. So it's Roman speaking. Howdy. Uh, so two questions on my side, just to ensure that uh, as we could have a remote uh, images through HTTP, we could rely on uh, uh, Swift object storage uh, with no problem. Yeah, there's there's no issue with the source image at the moment. Uh, our process on the image deploy or the image install, yeah, the image deploy side uh, relies on HTTP or local file path. Um, we certainly should be able to rework that fairly easily to reference either a remote S3 uh, or Swift. Um, S3 would probably be some, what we would be more interested in working. And since Swift, should you should be able to do uh, S3 compatibility API with your Swift cluster. And most people usually are. They turn on S3 API uh, with Swift and Ceph. Um, and then that covers Swift, Ceph, and AWS S3. Uh, we actually store our images in uh, some S3 buckets in some places and some use cases. So we certainly have an impetus to be able to um, keep an inventory of images to be able to host those in S3. Uh, haven't added that feature yet, I don't think. Uh, we would have to defer that to Greg, who's not with us today. Um, but I will put that on the docket to double check. And if not, uh, I'll put a drop a um, a uh, new uh, issue request into the process. And okay. as always, we'll you're, try you're welcome. No Go ahead. We will try it, no problem, and, uh, and make the feedback afterwards. And the uh, uh, second okay. question I had is, uh, do you plan to integrate uh, a mechanism to uh, snapshot uh, an actual uh, bar metal machine? Like I have a physical machine where uh, one so user made all of uh, customization and I'm able to reboot on what yeah, so the image? probably not in the way you mean snapshot as in the virtual machine world, but I have already developed a process with um, digital rebar to reboot a machine that's already running with an image uh, and then mount the drives and build an image off of that. So it's, you can take a copy of an existing built machine as opposed to building a machine through digital rebar and create an image from that. Now there are a number of caveats because the current uh, image deploy process requires uh, a couple of uh, things. Specifically, uh, we need uh, cloud init in it for the image deploy process to finish correctly. So if your machine doesn't have cloud init installed in it, you would have to install cloud init and you would have to create a slash curtain directory. Now we should be able to take that dependency away because you know it's pretty easy to do a make dir slash curtain, but I don't think we have that in there. So the image needs a slash curtain directory. Um, and I know that in Windows, that's required for the image to work as well. Um, so from the perspective of taking a, an existing running system, and as long as it sort of meets the Linux kernels and Grub and uh, Cloud init requirements, then we should be able to do that. And I'm hesitating a little bit because this whole process is new to us. I've done that with CentOS successfully. Um, and I'm still building the image builder uh, suite in the back end. And one of the features that I'm expecting to put in uh, is to be able to do that, B bounce a machine into Sledgehammer, uh, a, a live machine that's run, running, reboot it into Sledgehammer, image the machine, and then turn around and be able to lay down that image on other machines. Uh, how all of the Windows process works is, to be honest, a mystery with me. I've spent uh, all of my nearly three decades of career trying to avoid Windows as ardently as humanly possible, and I'm about to be thrust into the world of Windows deployment uh, management stuff with us. So we'll be working on that process as well. Um, I don't know what to tell you or, or what to expect from that side of the world. Um, 
but we do have, as demonstrated, uh, current image deploy capability, which came from an existing running machine. So in theory, we should be able to um, put something together on that side of the world. Does that sort of address your questions in terms of snapshot? I mean, it's not really yeah, fully, fully, fully. I saw, uh, I saw some tricks around it, and if uh, yeah, it could be implemented one day or another, it would be definitely help because in some cases you need to uh, rely on the hardware components like a graphic card or so, and this right. couldn't be done in a in a VM. So. Yep, exactly. And, and so I have actually developed the process on live hardware. So I, I've done this on live hardware as well. So it, it does exist both in a virtualized world and then within real hardware. You, the question about drivers is definitely germane, when it, especially when it comes to Windows, because Windows uh, builds are very sensitive physical hardware and installing specific drivers for physical hardware. Linux tends to be a lot more forgiving because most uh, full Linux distro suites have uh, for the most part, a, a significant broad range of hardware support in them. Uh, however, you do have specifically like you're referring to graphics um, uh, cards, which often don't have uh, high accelerated drivers in them, or some of the, the newer NICs like Mellanox uh, has a lot of NICs that oftentimes aren't supported out of the box with Linux for a while. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, any other questions around image deploy? Yes, I have a question um, regarding a strictly Linux CentOS 7 images um, being deployed to a, a bare metal cluster, um, two clusters uh, of 350 machines. Um, would this be a tool that we can use to do this? It's certainly one of the, the processes you could use. It, it depends on um, how uh, what you, your end goal is for those, you know, 350 machines, if they all have to be look alike, this is an excellent process for that because you develop a gold image. You can test that gold image in your CI CD pipeline, be relatively assured that your app stack and everything that you want is burned into it and works the way you want, and then deploy 350 duplicate copies of it uh, using the cloud in it to do some of your thin bootstrap configuration. So once the machine comes up, You'll need to bootstrap it, you know, things like host name and IP address, and there may be a, a few other things that you want to make unique in a given machine, but otherwise the machine is going to be a duplicate copy. If you have 350 machines in the cluster and you want 50 to be this and 50 to be that and 50 to be another thing and 50 to be another thing, uh, the image deploy process would probably work for you as well. If you had a wide range of things where you only wanted to create small clusters of you know, five to 10 machines and carve out a number of unique small clusters out of that hardware, you might want to look at a regular package-based deployment where you can do kickstart configurations that are a bit more unique. And then you might look at something like a, a post-deploy configuration management of your choice, whether that's uh, SaltStack, which is the best one out there. Sorry, no bias. Ansible, uh, Puppet, Chef, uh, Terraform, whatever those uh, add-on post-provisioning processing tools might be. Um, but definitely the, the deploy image deploy process is an excellent way to go, uh, particularly to ensure that the machines that you churn out are going to be the same. And that's the beautiful thing about image deploy as you reach that sort of golden panacea of immutable infrastructure. And once you've built a CI CD pipeline around the image create process, you can then do extensive testing of your single gold image. Be confident that the libraries, packages, applications, and tools that you put in there behave the way you want them to. Deploy them, and there'll be no surprises with snowflakes in your cluster. Okay, excellent. That's, that's exactly the answer we were looking for. Thank you. Excellent. Any other questions? That was from Victor. Victor, thank you for the question. Is everybody shy? There's no questions. You're all blown away with the amazing demo that I managed to, you have no idea how worried I was about this demo. <laughs> all right. Well, let's move on then. Uh, the next thing, uh, we're just going to sort of uh, show a quick overview. Uh, Victor covered this, I don't know, three or four uh, Victor Lowther on the rack inside, he covered three or four uh, times uh, meetups ago, but I'm just going to cover very briefly. I'm not actually going to demo this. 
because I'd like to open the floor up for questions and talk a little bit about some of the changes we have coming up. Uh, hopefully Rob will be back in a place where he's uh, able to ch chat with us again because I'd like to, to hear from him on uh, is UX. This, is my sound better? Because if so, then I can talk. Much, much, much better, yes. So give me just a minute and then I'll kick the floor over to you, Rob. Um, so for the, the, when you're building machines and you're, you're back in the traditional way of doing package-based repo uh, configuration and build, uh, you often uh, go through a cycle of build, test, tear down, build, test, tear down. And if you're using public mirrors, you could hit a public mirror that's really slow and you want to tear your hair out. There's a couple of things you can do to accelerate that process. Uh, some of the, the me mechanisms are pretty simple. Uh, if you're doing base Linux distro deployments and you just want a minimal deployment of CentOS 7, Debian 8, Debian 9, Ubuntu, whatever the, the community uh, content is or any of the exploded ISOs that you pull in, you can actually set digital rebar to serve uh, the deployment of the, that uh, machine against just the local repo, which is the exploded ISO contents. Very much just like you would in the old days, you stick a CD or a DVD in the drive or a USB thumb drive. To do that process, it's super simple. You just edit the machine, you grab the local repo param in your list, and you add it, and you say true. Click done. That literally is it. So if you have the local repo option set to true, it'll override the package repo settings uh, for the public repo mirrors uh, in Etsy yum, uh, .repos .d or Etsy app uh, sources.list and the actual digital rebar HTTP uh, port and endpoint for the exploded ISO contents to deploy against. Now, obviously, you get a very limited set of an OS install, but it really helps accelerate things. So that's one step. The second step, actually, let's stay back in here, is uh, you remove the local repo option, and you can install the, and my brain never remembers it until I see it, which is the package, no, sorry, um, proxy, proxy server. Um, where did it go? There we go. Proxy servers array. You add that and you literally just add in HTTP uh, 192.168.8.1 colon whatever your proxy port is. And I have a, uh, for my Ubuntu deploys, I use uh, app cacher ng, which is uh, simply a um, proxy, um, uh, what I call a greedy proxy. Uh, so as soon as the uh, package is requested, it, it pulls it from the upstream repos and caches it locally. So once you've warmed up your cache, then the next install will be completely from your local cache. You can do this with CentOS as well. I haven't found any tools quite as easy to use as AppCacher NG. You certainly can use Squid and set Squid up. You do have to do some munging with the Squid configuration to tell it how to handle uh, RPMs and packages and what upstream mm -hmm. we to use, uh, use, but it, the process works similarly. And it's literally just that simple to be able to define either your local repo or your proxy servers to serve off of. Um, and for those of you that are intrepid and have your own local repos in house and you don't want to hit them via a proxy pr parameter, uh, you can set through uh, in the Victor worked up a very nice um, uh, proxy or uh, repo override, which works with the community um, uh, uh, boot M's, where you can define all of your proxies, and those will be in, or not proxies, but your repo sites, and those will be injected into the machine. So, you, for those of you intrepid enough looking for that, uh, either hit us up online on the community channel on Slack, uh, or you can dig into. Uh, I'm hesitating because I can't remember the uh, repository stuff he did. I should remember it. it. It is documented in the read the doc somewhere, but you can find it in there. Hit us up on the Slack channel. Right. Uh, let's shift and, over. And, and Shane, I would, I would, I would 
one one thing to add about what you're showing is that it's easy to add these parameters because they're, they're built into the templates, right? What what yeah. you're there's no magic. The the templates the 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 templates we've been building have 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 you know have places where these variables are respect these parameters are respected. So if they're set, yes. they get used. If they're not, we we fall back to the safe defaults. Exactly. It's, good. Good. Good overview. Yes. Uh, let's go ahead and move over. Um, Rob, talk about UX stuff. You've done a lot of really cool little things. I got a chance to sort of show off uh, some of the minor uh, doodads, actually a couple of them, in fact, with the streaming logs and the refresh. Uh, uh, we also oh. got to see uh, the task list, which is really cool, right. and the deleting of profiles. Uh, what else? Am I missing anything in there? We've, we've got a lot let's of see. refinements that have been happening. Well, we, we've removed the boot uh pull down since that didn't seem to be helping to make things a little bit easier yeah the task the, the 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 task was the biggest one for me on this so that you get live updates of tasks and then you you don't have to drill into the machine to go to jobs so if you just click on task on the icons or the words you'll you'll go to the job where it is if you do that that'll bring you up and then this screen i think all i think a recent change made all of these pages uh, dynamically update but this one will dynamically update and then if you refresh the log view, uh, there's now an icon at the bottom that will pull in the latest logs. Yep, we were right there. Um, so if you're looking at a running job and you want to refresh the log, go ahead and click task for me. This one? There you go. No, that's uh, that's that view is awesome also. This is actually the log of the digital rebar endpoint, but in here, this, so the, the job is updated separately from the live log. So, so if you're not aware of it, as, as any task is run by the runner, we get live, live updates for the log. So you can actually see incremental progress, which was really important on these image, the Windows image download because it takes a couple of minutes. And so there's now a bottom right corner green refresh. Um, it changes color depending on whether or not the job is finished. But if you click that, it'll pull in the latest log. And it doesn't make the screen jump, so you stay where you are on the screen, and so you'll keep getting data. And then that little tit, little carrot, the up carrot, will shrink the log because it's getting pretty big. If you need to shrink it, um, so we're we're tweaking based on some of the pattern behavior changes we see for um, um, for using the image deployment work. And then if you go to info pro info preferences, Shane. Thank you. So one of the options you have here, there's two things on this that are nice. One is you can say I've completed the wizard, which stops it from doing the wizard check. So if you, this screen is like the home screen for the for a lot of actions. And so if you click this wizard is done, it won't do all these checks, which, which hit the API actually quite a bit. Um, and then the other thing is that we don't uh, do version inspections unless you went in, except when you start, which was causing to, which is confusing some people because we change the content uh, and updates pretty quickly. So when you hit the refresh button, it will go back to our servers, compare your versions, and tell you if there's any updates. So all that that's been um, those were changed. That lightens the load on um, sort of this screen. So we're trying to make this screen uh, faster and faster. And so one of the other things that I noted, it, and if folks aren't aware of, um, we control a lot of the um, capabilities between digital rebar provision, the UX, and content through feature flags. And feature flags are basically <laughs> that allows us to say, we support this or not, and if we don't support something, change the behavior uh, appropriately. And if uh, folks haven't noticed yet, the feature flag list is starting to grow some, and we're starting to add new capabilities. And as we add capabilities, we need to be able to support, you know, backwards compatibility and forwards compatibility. In some cases, some cases we throw away backwards compatibility, but uh, that's a good thing. So, for example, uh, with 3.7 landed, we had plugin v2, so that feature flag is here now. So it's a real quick check. Uh, if you're a content author, this is something Which, to be aware of. Uh, Go ahead. If, there's a change on the workflow page, too, I think. Yeah. 
if people have, if people haven't noticed um, and and your oh your and the live update request that you made is coming in also um, I think you I think it's in the it's in latest I suspect um, but maybe not um, so we just made this a little bit smaller and tighter because people were building long workflows and then one of the things that's coming is if you're building workflows via the API or two people are building workflows you'll get live updates in this page of the workflow being changed so it'll okay. um, so that that refresh function will come in um, somebody opened a bug against that so that's that that was got done um, what else yep those are, those are the main that's, ones. And actually, that's a good segue uh, on the workflow stuff because uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, moving forward some of the new features. Um, I'll start with the further out feature first, which is we're working on some very significant changes to the workflow process in general. So currently, workflow is defined as a parameter on a stage. So if you go to our global and we take a look at the change stage map, this is the old tried and true workflow definition. Uh, there are kind of a lot of um, um, things we'd like to make better, uh, particularly around workflow. Currently, if you set a machine <coughs> with multiple profiles, and if multiple profiles have different workflow definitions, uh, because of how workflow and the parameter uh, array uh, objects work, uh, you can end up with some rather interesting jumps in the workflow and unintended consequences. So you can actually end up, uh, if you've duplicated stages in multiple profile uh, workflow uh, definitions, you'll get very weird behavior, which is not what you expect. So it's very important that you apply uh, workflow very carefully and judiciously in your profiles and applying those profiles to a machine. So typically, we would suggest that you have literally a single profile that contains your workflow for a given workflow element and then you should break down your other components for content management into other profiles and apply those profiles without workflow in them to ensure you don't have any interactions with workflow problems that and other reasons as our venerable greg would say other reasons uh, we're making some changes to promote workflow as a sort of first class citizen uh, uh, in a field within the JSON uh, definitions as opposed to a parameter buried in the metadata uh, structures of existing JSON. Uh, and we're also changing the structure of how workflow definitions are made such that you can create multiple workflows reusing uh, stage components and be able to specify uh, dynamically which set of workflows that you would like to jump into. So there's a number of changes there. This is still mostly all whiteboard work, so it, it, it's a long ways out, and everything I tell you today is probably a lie and will change. That's actually not true. I think we've come up with um, a pretty good outline of how the workflow process is going to work. Uh, within the next uh, week or three, uh, Victor and Greg will be working on prototyping the new workflow system. Uh, it's something to be aware of because coming down the road, uh, we will be implementing the new workflow system. However, don't panic. Uh, we've worked out very carefully how to ensure backwards compatibility. So for those of you that want to maintain the existing stage map uh, workflow process, uh, all of that stuff will stay in place. That code will be untouched. We're not going to try and uh, uh, pervert the new workflow system by making it backwards compatible. Uh, it just would make uh, too many trade-offs in what we would like to be able to do with workflow going forward. So we made the decision to separate the two pieces of code and features so that we can ensure both backwards compatibility 100% uh, with the existing workflows that folks have out there. And then you can start moving into the new workflow process when you're ready to start converting your existing workflow uh, changes to the new process. Um, again, that's all um, pretty rough outlines. Uh, hopefully we'll have a lot more details for you and specifics on how it works. Uh, in the next uh, meetup or two, uh, coming from the horse's mouth, so to speak, uh, the guys writing the code and implementing the specific changes. Uh, one of the other uh, changes that we're working on, which is actually in TIP, 
So, and this is a fair warning for folks that uh, live on the bleeding edge. If you take TIP, which I don't have here, but you'll see in your feature flags, you'll see a feature flag come up called FSM-runner, which is a finite state machine uh, change within the runner. And the runner code is being changed to be much more uh, flexible, robust, and capable. Um, but uh, as with all new features, this is right now sort of an alpha slash beta release. So if those of you are interested in seeing how the new uh, runner behaves, we would greatly appreciate feedback on that uh, if you're running in lab environments and testing and you have some extra cycles to play with it. We would love some feedback on how things are behaving for you within the runner and within the ERPC live process uh, machines process job side of the house uh, on your machines during workflow uh, processing. So, right. Some of the reasons why that new runner uh, state machine is interesting is because it lets you stop jobs, and it also would handle reboots. So you could you could in incorporate reboots into workflows um, more gracefully. So two those are. There are a whole bunch of reasons for this, but those are two of the big features that people notice. Yep, exactly. Um, that being said, I'm going to wrap up the discussions on new features and stuff and leave the last uh, bit of the meetup open for anything, Rob, if you had anything you wanted to talk about, and then we'll do community. I, there, there's one other feature that, that is um, available in TIP also um, that's really interesting which is, um, so plugins, we've been extending the plugin model a little bit to handle better initialization uh, and destruction sequences. And the new, uh, the plugin, that's not new, the plugin for uh, VirtualBox is going to start including machine create and destroy oh, capabilities. Yeah. yeah. Plus so, we have a KVM um, plugin coming. And, and uh, so KVM is, it would be for Linux KVM, it's not libvirt as the distinction, but um, which we use for testing uh, quite a bit. So literally, you'll be able to create a machine in uh, Digital Rebar and then have it talk to it as external systems to create the matching system. Um, and so there's, there's all sorts of interesting implications for how that would interact with um, other, other systems in a, in a more controlled, controlling way uh, rather than just a responding way. Uh, that is... That's a, going to be a subject probably for a whole meetup. It's it's a pretty intense um, mind bender on the ramifications, but it's coming. It's exciting. Excellent. All right, opening the floor for community. Any questions, comments, ideas, discussion points from our community members? Hey Shane, it's Will. Will, um, what's happening, man? Long yeah, time talk. long time. Where you been? Me. Right, I've been doing work. <laughs> <laughs> At some, some of which would digital rebar provision. Um, so I know there. I I had a uh, issue raised about like consolidating this the apartment stuff all into one. Do we know where that's at? That is that is that in Greg's ball court? Uh, it's in all of our ball court, and I don't think we've done much with it, honestly, Will. Um, I know that uh, there are some discussions about getting some changes made around that um, within the contents uh, templates, but I don't think we've done anything with that. All right. Yeah, Greg, last I heard, Greg was thinking about it, and yes. he didn't say more than that. If so, Greg's thinking about it yeah. now, then that's not good because he's on vacation right now. So I'm hoping Greg is thinking sandy beaches and sun. And that's good. Well, maybe I'll think. He's doing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. Just wanted to see what's going on with that. All right. Any and then, then this uh, workflow okay. thing. Yep. Uh, um, that, right now it's a parameter of a profile, right? Correct. Well, it actually, it's just yeah, a parameter, so, and you can apply it anyway, either a param directly on a machine, a param in a profile, et cetera. There's a lot of ways to apply it, wherever you can apply a param. Oh, stage map could be on a machine? Yep, directly without it being in a profile. That's interesting. Yeah, so you can have a, a single um, workflow 
uh, via uh, just the single param. Um, it's just, um, I'm not sure about the rendering of that in the UX, so that's a good question now thinking about right. that if we only render workflows through in profiles, profiles, we index them through profiles in the uh, workflow map. Um, but yes, a, a workflow a change stage map is just a pram and can be applied directly to a machine. All right. So, so in the future, it's, it's going to be its own thing, right? And, and you would apply it either, it would be yeah, so, like so pulled like from a profile or a machine or something as a object, right? Right. So workflow will become its own object. So instead of specifying uh, like DRP CLI stages, DRP CLI profiles, DRP CLI params, you'll now have presumably, and again, this is all up in the architecture, but I believe it'll end up being DRP CLI workflows. Right. And you would define it through a top level or a first class sort of object uh, that will also be stored as a field within JSON and, and not within a param within the, the um, structures of the J, the metadata data structures of the, the JSON blob. So it's a lot more um, uh, first classy from that respect. And it's, um, It'll be the, the de how it's defined is still not 100% set in stone, but the definition will be a lot less confusing. One of the problems is the the, the ordering of the workflow gets sort of per, um, yeah perverted gets based right. on restructuring, and so it's sometimes really hard if you're looking at the JSON uh, context to follow the flow. Yeah, the flow, which the UX helps you to sort of reassemble and see the flow, which is why that. Uh, whole UX workflow map stuff came about. Um, so it'll also make the, the workflow UX stuff much easier because currently we go through a whole lot of uh, permutations and loops to try and iterate over that pram to draw a correct iteration of the workflow. Um, right. But ultimately it's going to allow you essentially multiple workflows that are uh, clearly defined, which will allow you to do things like fan in and fan out operations. We currently can do fan in. Fan in works by having, as you can see on the screen right now, I have discover and image deploy. So fan in means that if I put a, a machine into discover, it'll do the discover workflow. If I put it in image deploy, it'll do the image deploy workflow. However, because of the limitations, if I um, put multiple workflows with the same stages in them, you get weird behavior sometimes. You, that aren't unintended and it gets even more complex if you have multiple profiles with multiple stage maps in them uh, applied to a given machine you can actually jump from one profile stage map into the next profile stage map and do half of one profile stage map and half of the next profile stage map which is not what you typically intended uh, because you can't uh, um, define the same stage multiple times and get the behavior you expect. Yep. And that's one of the sort of limitations of the workflow process uh, that we have currently, which is why we want to rethink this and how it's built and how it's applied and consumed. Okay. Now I'm looking uh, forward any to other that. Questions? Uh, not to, sorry. Well, just, I know we started a little late, but I want to wrap up here pretty quick because we're top of the hour and some people have other, meetings they would like to move on to. So any other questions from the field? All right, we'll call out a wrap on lucky number 13. Uh, everyone, thank you very much for all your participation. As always, if you have additional questions or comments, please follow up with us on the Pound Community uh, Slack channel. Um, looking at all the names here, I recognize most of all of you from our Slack channel already, so presumably we see you all in Slack, come talk to us. Uh, we also really would love feedback if anybody gets a chance to test the FSM uh, finite state machine changes with a runner and tip, but please uh, only do that uh, in a lab scenario. It's not, not quite ready for production. Uh, any feedback you have will help us sort of shape it and refine it and make it better. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. See you uh, in two weeks at number 14 uh, meetup, and that's a wrap.
so rob, i don't know if you still have recording going, you'll probably want to stop.